Sound Speeds, and welcome back to the Sound Speeds Podcast. Remember the Geeks Rising Podcast community? You may be wondering where my headphones are. Well, I'm going to be pointing on my ears some today, so I figured, why bother using them? Let's waste no more time and get right into our content. If you were to close your eyes and then someone were to simply rub their fingers together somewhere in front, behind, to the left, the right, above, or below you, believe it or not, you could probably point to where that sound is coming from without moving your head with pretty decent accuracy. Why is this? How is it possible that with just two ears, you're able to directionally tell where those sounds are coming from? Well, believe it or not, your ears are very finely tuned to your head. And if I were to take my ears off and put them on you, you would have to recalibrate and relearn how to hear with my ears because your ears are different shape than mine. So let's just start off easy with left and right. Well, that's pretty obvious. If something is directly in the middle in front of me, you're going to hear both of those sounds coming into both ears evenly in the exact same timing, right? But if I were to move it a little bit over to the left or right, let's say it's right over here now, it's closer to this ear than it is this ear. Therefore, the timing, even though it is so slightly different in timing, it might be a tenth of a millisecond difference, but your brain is going to be able to make that calibration because this ear is hearing it before this ear. And not just that, this ear is being blocked partially by my head and not being able to hear line of sight to those fingers. So this ear is going to hear it differently than this ear with slightly reduced frequencies in certain ranges. So the air, the ears and the brain are going to do some calculations and say, based on the frequency attenuation that we hear and the frequencies that we are hearing in general and the timing, we're going to predict that based on all of those measurements, which are done almost instantaneously, that the sound is coming from right here. Farther over here, it's going to be picked up by this ear far earlier than this ear in the grand scheme of things. And with a lot more clarity, because this ear is going to be hearing it very, very close line of sight in optimal fidelity. Now, if you have one ear that is good, one ear that is maybe damaged, let's say that you only wore an earplug in one ear and you used to be in a band. Well, obviously, you're not going to be able to directionally hear nearly as well as you would be if you're ears were both fairly even. Now, what about above and below you? Well, believe it or not, the pinna of your ear right here is shaped a particular way that your brain is used to, you know, calibrate with. Uh, and it's able to use this and the sound uh, vibrations that, that come in through the air it bounces off of here, goes through into your ear. It might go through the ear and reduce in attenuation certain frequencies. It might come up from the bottom. Wherever the sound is coming from, it's going to go through parts of this or bounce here and then go into your inner ear. Whatever angle it happens to be coming in at, your brain is going to be able to hear what is done with that sound and calibrate the timing difference between these ears. And if both of your ears are picking up a certain attenuation, like for example, if a sound is directly behind your head, well, your ears are here, you're going to be hearing that sound through this part of the pinna. And so it's going to be reduced in frequency. And if both ears are picking it up with that reduced frequency, it's going to assume that the sound is coming from behind you. Now, what if it's a sound you're not familiar with? Well, then it may be a little more difficult because you're going to say, well, I can't tell what the sound actually is. But even then, your brain is going to be able to somewhat piece this together based on memory and what last you heard that sounds something similar. So above and in front and behind and below. So above and below and in front and behind are more or less the same when it comes down to bouncing off of the pinna or hearing through your ear in general. Now, it's timing, it's frequencies, it's the shape of your ear. There's a whole lot of little factors that are calibrated and taken into consideration when your brain is doing the processing to see exactly where that sound is coming from. But if you want to play around, hold your head completely still and have someone just make a little sound someplace and you're going to be able to identify where it's coming from. Now, what if you were born without the ability to see and you could hear? Well, does that mean that your ears are never going to be trained? No, because people that do not have eyesight are going to have heightened senses of things like hearing, right? 
we already always hear this heightened senses. Usually the other four senses are going to be heightened. But with regards to hearing, that is going to be like critical because you have to use that to basically help you to see, you know, how far away something is. With your eyes, you'd be able to see that a sign is right in front of you. But with your ears, you might have to listen for resonance of certain frequencies off of certain things and say, wait a minute, I'm hearing something like, it sounds like a wall is coming up on me. And then you would know that you're coming up on a wall. And that's something that you can, you can maybe listen to because you don't have eyes. You would be able to, you know, heighten that sense of hearing. But what about training it? Well, very simply put, if there is a sound coming from right here, and if I didn't have the ability to see, I might have to turn my head left or right a little bit in order to help dial in on that perspective. And that would help my ears to tune exactly where that sound is coming from. Once you do that a bit, and you are someone without eyesight trying to rely on your ears, you're going to be able to train your ears based on your life experiences. So if you're trying to hear something right here, left or right, if something is above or below, you can easily tilt your head like this and you're going to be able to figure out what it is and where it's coming from based on what you hear. And, and people without the ability to see are going to be able to use their ears for that exact purpose, just like you are when you have those visual cues. So this is how your brain and your ears, the ear shape, everything is going to be taking in all the information and helping you to determine exactly where a sound is coming from. It has to do with what part of your ear you're hearing through, what attenuation and frequencies are going to be happening through certain parts of your ear, where it's it, it's going to be attenuated at all, how much is attenuated, maybe, maybe it's going through your head. There's timing differences from one ear to the other. There's frequency differences, a whole lot of different factors, and your brain does all those calculations instantaneously. It may seem kind of odd that a production sound person would find it absolute genius when an actor says why they like doing ADR. I'm going to explain why here in a moment, but first, what is ADR? ADR is automated dialogue replacement. Basically put, let's just say that you're recording in, a, in an outdoor environment. There's cicadas, there's traffic, air conditioning units, and the actors are whispering and there's a wide shot so you can't get a microphone within four feet. That audio is not going to be able to make the movie. So what they're going to have to do is re-record that in some sort of a studio environment, and ADR is the process by which that happens. Usually it involves making the audio as good as it possibly can be. The actors are going to be brought into the studio, shown their performance, and they're going to be able to listen to their take the way that they did it on the show as well as they possibly can. And then they're going to have to recreate that performance. Everything from the energy level to their dialogue to their dialect and, and accents that if, if any, they're going to have to emulate their performance performance and everything. They're going to have to capture everything, even though it could be weeks, sometimes months later when they actually go into the, the voiceover booth to re-record their audio. This is something a lot of actors don't like doing because it's very hard for them to get back into character, figure out where their mind was in that scene and, you know, to recreate that performance in a sound booth. And they don't want to have to do that, but also because it takes a lot of time. It could mean that that they're in the middle of trying to do some other movie or they have other things they would rather do. And now they have to spend all day in a recording booth, re-recording lines that they wish could have gotten, you know, right on the day. But it's not always getting it right on the day. Sometimes it is just getting an other take of it for post to consider. Sometimes they will take the sound that is recorded in the booth, they will take that and add it to the production dialogue to actually boost certain frequencies and make someone sound more bassy, make someone sound a little higher pitch. They can actually fatten up sound and dialogue by adding in both tracks a little bit. But why is it then that Samuel L. Jackson, a brilliant actor to work with, I might add, he is someone who is absolutely prepared. He's a pleasure to work with. He's funny. He is on the ball. He knows his craft so well. Work with him any day of the week. Why is it that he had a take on ADR that not only did I find interesting, but I find absolutely genius? Let me tell you why, and you'll, you'll understand. When an actor is performing, they are delivering a performance from their heart, based on their uh, their mentality of their character, based on on the way that they, they they envision the character doing something physically, the way that they envision the character sounding, all the different elements together, how they do everything, how they sound, how everything is done. 
actors have a lot of things sometimes that they're that are not even related to the performance that they have to keep in mind. Like if you're going to walk into a room and you have to hit a certain mark and then you have to maybe turn on a dime or pivot or shift a hip or turn their head or something like that to make room for a, a camera to go by them or something like that. There's a lot of things that aren't necessarily related to the performance that actors need to do in order to make it work on camera. So what is it that Samuel L. Jackson said about ADR? Well, he said that he does not know which take they're going to use when it gets into post. And then he loves doing ADR because once they take him into an ADR booth, he's able to see the way he was able to deliver that performance on camera. He knows that that's the take they're going to be using for the movie. And then he can make himself deliver the dialogue and the performance the way he wants it to match the visual. Oh, that's fascinating, isn't it? It's not just someone that can say, okay, I'm going to try to match performance on camera with my voice. No, he will make it sound like he wants it to look. And you may say, well, doesn't that always work that way? No, not necessarily. I could be completely monotone, but very animated in my actions or vice versa. I could be very, very muted with my actions, but my voice sounds highly energetic. It doesn't match at all. But actors have so many things going on, they might not deliver their dialogue in a way that matches their performance on screen. Especially if you're doing so many takes that actors are constantly thinking of every single little bitty thing that they have to do to get it right for this particular take. Once they get into the ADR booth, they're going to be able to see which take was used. Now, Samuel L. Jackson told me when he was talking about, he was talking about recording, uh, re-recording and, and stuff in post. And I said, he said he loves doing ADR. I said, why do you like doing ADR? No actors like doing ADR. He says, I love it. I said, why? And he said, because I'll tell you why. And he said exactly what I just told you. He said, because when I watch the show, when I see the take that was picked, I'm able to deliver my dialogue the way I want it to be heard in the movie. Isn't that genius? I mean, you don't hear that kind of stuff out of a lot of actors. Actors normally will do ADR and they'll just make it match their performance. But that take to me, is so fascinating. And that take to me is coming straight from someone that knows the entire package, the way that someone looks, the way someone sounds, the way someone does every little bitty action, the way someone handles something, hands something, walks, every little bitty thing goes back to the performance and the, uh, and the, uh, the overall impression of that actor's performance for that movie. It's not just the way they look. It's not just the way they sound. It's the combination of everything. Some actors, they just have a certain look that everyone likes, but they don't necessarily sound good. Some actors have a great voice, but they're nothing to look at. And I'm not talking about their actual looks. I'm talking about their performance, what they actually give on screen. But someone like Sam Jackson, he is the total package. He knows he's the total package, and he wants to make sure that the performance that he delivers on screen is absolutely the way he thinks it should be for that movie. That is brilliant. So there you have it. Another episode of the Sound Speeds podcast. Complete. Done. Finn. Maybe I shouldn't say Finn because if you're a child of the 80s like I am, you might remember what Finn, what kind of shows put Finn at the end. You deviant little people. Anyway, thanks for watching this episode of Sound Speeds. I'll see you in a couple weeks with another episode. Take care. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.